our, our sermon series for Lent, Shadows of the Savior. And today it's Tamar. So I'm going to read to you uh, from Genesis 38 as I go through this, uh, the sermon in, in sections. We're not going to read the whole thing all at once because it's an awful lot, actually. Well, J. Vernon McGee, who was the noted radio pastor and host of Through the Bible program, do you remember that one, the oh, Bible yeah. bus? You know? He called Genesis 38 the worst chapter in the Bible. <laughs> You know, and apparently most pastors agree because it's very seldom ever a text for sermons. But you know, I disagree because I find in Genesis, as I find everywhere else in the Bible, if I look, not a horrible chapter, but the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. As Paul the Apostle counseled his student pastor Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. And so Genesis 38 provides us with a powerful manifestation of the shadow of the Savior falling darkly, not on Judah, as might be expected, but upon Tamar, the woman who was scorned and rejected. In the story of Judah and Tamar, we find a new chapter in the ongoing work of God's saving grace for Israel, the people of God's promise, and in the promise of Abraham for the whole world. I'm going to read the scripture in parts, and I'm going to comment as I go along. So I'm going to read the first 11 verses. And thank you, Christine. She did a great job with that. This is a whole chapter that's on here, so you can follow along or just listen if you should wish to. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met a daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, who was named Er. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kaziv that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er... Judah's firstborn was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill, fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his, so whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing an offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. <laughs> Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. The first words in the story are at that time. It's important to know what came immediately before this story to understand what happened next. Because Genesis 38 appears right smack dab in the middle of Joseph's story, right after he was sold by his brothers to the Egyptian slave traders. It was Judah who convinced his brothers to sell Joseph rather than to kill him, and Judah who encouraged the lie to their father about Joseph's death. Judah was responsible for tearing his whole family apart. And Jacob, his father, grieved inconsolably despite the comfort of his daughters and sons and never got over the loss of Joseph. So it was at that time that Judah decided to move away from the family, doubtless to remove himself from the daily reminder of his guilt through his father's pain. He went down from the hill country where Jacob had pitched his tents far away from the temptations of the pagan culture of Canaan. And Judah chose to settle in the plain of Canaan near Adullam, which was a Canaanite royal city, where all manner of pleasures were at hand, but where the God of Abraham was not worshipped. So Judah left everything behind. He turned his back on his family, his culture, and his God. Now we're told in Adullam he met a Canaanite woman and he married her. And they had those three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Now when Er was of marital age, Judah, as was the custom of the patriarch of the family, 
secured a bride for his son from among the local maidens, and her name was Tamar. Er's marriage was short-lived, however, because he died suddenly. We're not told how he dies, but that his death was the direct result of his offending the Lord. Er was not living righteously, but wickedly, the scripture says, and this resulted in God's judgment against him. Now, there's an important clue for us in how we are to understand the story, I think, that lifts it from the mundane realm of a personal or even a family context into a rightful context, which is as part of God's master plan. This is not just another story about the entrenched dysfunction in the family of Abraham. You might remember when we studied Genesis, I mean, he just stumbled along from one mistake to another, basically. It's a facet here of what God is doing through those whom he has chosen to carry out his design. And so it's vital for us to see this at this point, because in Genesis, such divine actions at the individual level are reserved for moments when the future of God's people is at stake. So ere he dies without producing a son and an heir. And as head of the family, Judah was obliged to enact a nation custom known as the Leveret Law. This is something that was routinely done. Under this law, the next oldest brother of the deceased husband was required to unite with the brother's widow to produce a son who would be regarded as the legal heir of the deceased. Now this may seem primitive to us, but it served many purposes in ancient Israel. First, it ensured that the deceased's name would not be lost. When the heir was, was dead, he was not just going to be dead because if he had a son, his son would carry the name on. They believed that immortality was carried on through offspring. And so they took great measures to ensure that a man's name would not be blotted out of Israel. That's how the Bible puts it. The elaborate law also allowed for it an orderly transfer of property from one generation to the next. Now in the case of the oldest son, heir, a double portion of his father's estate would go to him on the death of Judah. So he would get 50% because there were three sons. Now with this law, the double portion that would go to the son of heir would go to any offspring he had. And so it was important for him to have offspring, even if it wasn't his natural offspring. And finally, the Leveret law sustained the status and life of the widow who would maintain her place in the patriarchal clan that saved her from economic deprivation and uncertain social status. Now in ancient biblical times, women didn't have any rights. We think that, you know, women here need liberation, but <laughs> they wouldn't have even had a, an idea of what we were talking about back then. A woman's whole existence was defined by the males in her household. If she's unmarried, she's under the direction of her father and the protection. Married women were under their husbands, and widows, like Tamar, were under their fathers-in-law. They had nothing to say about what went on in their lives. Even if she didn't like the idea of the Leverett Law, she had to abide by it. Not much choice, I guess. So Judah orders this second son, Onan, who's not married, by the way, at this point, or any point, actually, to fulfill the Leverett obligation to Tamar. But Onan had ideas of his own. Instead of honoring the law and his father's wishes, his sister-in-law's rights, he used her for his own physical pleasure without any intention of ever fathering a son or a child. Could have been a girl, I suppose, first. His deceit may have been motivated, though, by his own greed to get the dead brother's inheritance, because if no heir was produced, he would get it. He would get more than the younger brother. But Onan made a big mistake. His refusal to consummate the Leveret Law and his abuse of Tamar was a disgrace, according to the law. And when divorced from his kinship obligation, his abusive relationship with Tamar was equivalent to incest. And like his brother before him, Onan displeased the Lord and it cost him his life. God was displeased with the attitude of Onan's heart. Onan's selfish motivation thwarted not only the good intentions of the law, the justice for the widow, and the long-term welfare of the family, but also the grand design of God's master plan. 
Now with Onan's death, Judah finds himself in a fearful dilemma. His third son, Shelah, was too young to fulfill the Leveret law. But Judah saw this as a blessing in disguise. Now we're told in scripture that he feared that Tamar was like some kind of a black widow who had a hand in causing the death of his son. And so he seized the opportunity to protect his youngest son by sending Tamar back to her father's house until the youngest son grows to manhood. But we know what Judah does not know. The death of his sons had nothing to do with Tamar, but everything to do with God and the obligation of the family of Abraham through Judah to God. We go on. The characteristic in Abraham that marked his relationship with God was righteousness. Abraham believed God, the scripture said, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now he wasn't perfect, didn't mean Abraham was perfect, but he tried to live out God's command to walk before me and be blameless. That's what God said to him. And so his great-grandsons, Aaron and Onan, they didn't walk with God, but against him. They thwarted the promise of Abraham that those who blessed Abraham by fulfilling God's intention through Abraham's family, even a couple generations down, that they would be blessed. But Aaron and Onan, they got no free pass because they were blood relations of Abraham. They chose to live wickedly and invoked God's curse on themselves. God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And so in a very real way, Er and Onan cursed the family of Abraham by refusing to honor their sister-in-law's claim on them to produce an heir. Judah was now very close to invoking God's curse on himself. Because up to this point, he, he did make every effort, probably grudgingly, to, to treat Tamar rightly under the law. But when he was down to the last son, he feared for him. And so he began a deception of his own. He sent Tamar back to her father's house. This was a calculated move. I mean, you have to know a little bit about biblical history and the dynamics of the community. But it was a calculated move that showed he no longer considered her a member of his household. And he had no intention of giving Shelah to raise an heir. And so these callous actions that Judah made against Tamar left her in limbo. She was not considered a real widow by the community who was free to marry again. But she was condemned to wait many years until this youngest son grew up and her father-in-law remembered his duty to her. But until that time, she had no way of demanding her rights, and her childbearing years were fading away. So the final words in this passage speak eloquently of Tamar's righteousness and her obedient heart. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. So now we continue on in verse 12 through 19. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hira the Adalamite went with him. I think there's something missing here. He sees... Oh, I, need, I need the Bible. I can't. We're missing too much here. I don't have a Bible up here. Okay. This is one. You got it? Thank you. Yeah. This is an important part. We can't miss this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so he's gone up to shear the sheep. That was a big time of celebration. Lots of drinking and guy talk, I guess. <laughs> yeah, smoking cigar up there. So when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes and covered herself with a veil to disguise herself. And then she sat down at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had grown up now, she had not been given to him as a wife. 
And when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you, she asked. I will send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she asked. And he said, well, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. And so he gave them to her and he slept with her and she became pregnant by him. And after she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adelamite in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. And he asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who is beside the road here at Enaim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, well, let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. So, Scripture tells us that years had passed, and Judah's wife died. And when the morning period's over, he goes up to the hill country with his friend Hiram to join in the sheep shearing, a time of celebration. And Tamar hears through the local grapevine that Judah would pass by her village when she when he went to the she sheep shearing. So we gather that she hasn't seen or heard from him all this time. We're from Shelah. But she knew that Shelah was now grown up. He was a man. And still, Judah had not honored his legal obligation to her. And so she disguised herself with a veil and stationed herself along the road as Judah passed by. Now, I think it's very tempting for us to pass judgment on what follows. But it's important that the Bible makes no judgment about the propriety or the rightness of Tamar's or Judah's behavior. It really doesn't. And when we look at this with our 20th century eyes, we tend to censure, I think, what's going on here. But her context has to be, her conduct has to be viewed in the context of this scripture and of the time. Because it was customary at that time for pagan women to give themselves to strangers, believe it or not, as a sacrificial act of worship to a god or goddess, such as the fertility goddess Ishtar. So if a woman was not able to become pregnant by her husband, she would find some Joe on the road, I guess. And uh, sometimes it worked, I guess. But the reference to Tamar as a temple prostitute bears out that she appeared as a married woman. These were married women. These weren't pr professional, you know, temple uh, workers, let's put it that way. <laughs> Discharging a sacred duty is what she was, would be seen as doing. She wouldn't be seen as a harlot. And Judah also viewed her in this way. Now, his overture to her seems very stir of the moment, doesn't it? Because he doesn't have any money. He doesn't get any way to pay her. So she asked for some security in the form of his signet and his personal staff. Now, in number 17, we read that each of the chieftains of Israel, and the Judah would have been one of them, had his own uniquely identifiable staff and a signet ring with a seal on it was his personal signature. And so these possessions could only be tied to one man, and that would be Judah. And so the irony of this encounter, I think, becomes apparent as the story goes on. Because Tamar was about to perform a life-giving ritual that could very well result in her own death. And though it appeared that Tamar was making a sacrificial act of worship for a pagan deity, she was in reality engaging in a sacred act sanctioned by none other than the deity, God Almighty, as part of his plan. I'm going to go on to verses 20 through 26. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she's now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she, she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. 
And she added, see if you recognize who seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shiloh. And he did not sleep with her again. So three months passed, and Judah was unable to recover his personal possessions, or even find a trace of the woman. But through the grapevine, he hears that Tamar is pregnant. And the rumor around town was that she had played the harlot. Now, doubt the smarting still from his own humiliating interlude with a shady lady, Judah rashly pronounced an extreme death sentence on Tamar that would take care of her once and for all, as far as he was concerned. And he was within his rights as the head of the family to act as judge and jury on such a transgression. But you know, he was on shaky moral ground because his own actions proved that by sending Tamar back to her father's house to begin with, he had released any claim he had on her as family. But Judah chose to act on the crime as adultery by virtue of Tamar's engagement to Shelah. And so the usual punishment for adultery was death by stoning, but Judah's fury drives him to seek the most horrific death sentence allowed by law, death by burning. Bring her out and have her burned to death. But you know, by the law, the death sentence was pronounced on both adulterers the man as well as the woman. In condemning Tamar, Judah had just pronounced his own death sentence. Mm -hmm. Now Tamar, picture this woman here. She stands at the juxtaposition of her own life and death, the life and death of the child. The brutal injustice of Judah's pronouncement is heightened by the nobility and compassion of her response. What does she do? She could have called him out into the public square and exposed his crime with the whole community as witnesses because she had proof. But she doesn't do this. The strength of her character is revealed in counterpoint to the cruelty meted out to her by Judah. And so she stands out there in the public square awaiting her own death sentence. And she quietly sends an emissary with the signet and staff and the ring, back to her father-in-law. Judah's cowardice is eclipsed by Tamar's courage and her grace that allowed Judah to confront his own transgression in private rather than in a public show of disgrace. He could have gone on with that death sentence if he just hid the proof. Who would believe her? But most importantly, Tamar gave Judah the opportunity to reclaim his own dignity in showing that she, in spite of all the wrongs that he had done to her, had faith that he would do the right thing. And finally, Judah does the right thing. He acknowledges the paternity of Tamar's child and assures its legitimacy in his household. And he admits his great wrong in not having done right by Tamar. But most importantly and most significantly in this whole passage, Judah admits that Tamar is the righteous one. Now righteousness in the Bible goes way beyond just being correct or right about something. It speaks to the personal character and the standing of the person before God. Righteousness means that a person is in the right place before God, a right relationship. And none of the others in this story were righteous. Surely not Ur or Onan, nor Judah. None of them cared for what God cared for. Righteousness was the mark of Abraham who believed in the Lord. You read the story and you'll see that Abraham's offspring did many things to test God's grace. And yet Tamar, a pagan Canaanite woman outside of the whole clan, born outside of Abraham's family, the family that was chosen by God, is the righteous one. I marvel at this fact, and I wonder, how can this be? How could Tamar be an obedient and faithful servant of the Lord when the scripture is silent about whether she even had a relationship with God? 
We don't see that here, do we? Even in the household of her families, her husband's family, the relationship with the God of Israel was distant, if not non-existent. We don't hear anything about God, do we? Certainly, she couldn't have learned much about God from her husband or her father-in-law. Yet she was righteous. Why? Because her heart was in the right place. Her motivations were right, and come what may, Tamar did what she knew to be right in her heart, and God honored her no matter what the cost would be. Now it's true, she may not have had a personal relationship with the Lord, or perhaps an indirect relationship, but her faithfulness to her dead husband and his family in bearing the son to carry on his name at grave personal cost fulfilled the blessing of Abraham and the promise of God in her life. God promised to bless those who blessed Abraham. And so Tamar's steadfastness in honoring her marriage commitment, both as a wife and a widow, despite the fact that no one else did, shows that she had the requirements of God written on her heart. She gave, God gave Tamar, and he gives to all of us that inner compass that helps us to find the right way, to find God's way, as an interior witness to what's right. We often call it the conscience, don't we? That's what it is. But it's created in us by God. And Tamar allowed herself to be guided by this inner compass when everything outside was against her. And she took drastic measures way outside the conventions of her family and even the laws of her society to do what she knew to be right. And she risked her life to do it. The last part of the scripture. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, and so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first, but when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. And she said, so this is how you've broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was named Zerah. This story is messy. It's unflattering. It calls us to wrestle with things that make us uncomfortable. I haven't heard anybody even breathe in this room since I started <laughs> reading that scripture. <laughs> you know, I can see why Gordon McGee was so shocked. I mean, it's a shocking scripture. There's no black or white here, though. It's gray. It's a gray world that Tamar finds herself living in. She existed in the constant tension of what she knew to be right and all the wrongs that were done to her that she couldn't control. Well, her heart yearned to do the right thing. She found that she had to step outside what her culture said was right to do what was truly right. And so she's a great heroine of the Bible and a challenging example for us as Christians as we live in our own culture today. Because her heart was right with God, the Lord guarded, guided her to do what was righteous. Following her heart, need, she needed to be countercultural. Jesus, by the way, was countercultural, in case you forget. She had to work against her own culture, her own norms to bring about what God had planned. She knew her mission. She pursued it with every means available to her, valiantly, even to the point of personal injury or death. And she knew the difference between what was merely legal and what was actually right in God's eyes. And she stood up for what is right. Tamar alone is unquestionably phrased as righteous in this very sad story. She was blessed by God as the bearer of the promise of Abraham and in her generation. The shadow of the Savior covered her as a protective shield from all the harms that were perpetrated on her, building in her a righteous faith that carried her throughout the living of God's plan. Like the Savior, she sacrificed herself in obedience to God to fulfill his claim on her life. And the shadow of the Savior was also carried in the womb of Tamar. Because if you want to know how the story ends, 
you have to turn forward to Matthew's Gospel, where you will see not only the Savior's name, but Tamar's written alongside his. The record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Our closing prayer is a meditation on Psalm 34 that was written by Tamar's great-grandson many generations later, King David. And when I read this psalm, I often wonder if he had his great, great, ever so great grandmother in mind as he wrote it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Tamar, that you included her in your word. Without it, we may not come to understand the magnitude of your love for us. For you take each one of us whom you have created, and even though we begin as disobedient outsiders rejecting your love, you draw us into a relationship with you that surrounds and protects us with your love. Like Tamar, we sought you and you answered. You deliver us from all our fears. You save us out of all our troubles. Your angel encamps around all who fear you and deliver us. You invite us to taste and see that you, Lord God, are good. Your blessing falls on those who take refuge in you. Your eyes are on the righteous. Your ears are attentive to their cry. Your face is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. You deliver the righteous from all their troubles. Lord, you promise that you are near to the brokenhearted, and you save those who are crushed in spirit. You redeem your servants, and no one will be condemned who takes refuge in you. Because of the love of the Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.